Have you ever been, had a situation in your life that you've been presented with, and you knew it was unfair, and you waffled back and forth, should I get involved, should I say something, or should I just mind my own business and let well enough alone? I imagine there are times that <clears throat> Each of us will get to a place where we, where when enough is enough, and we stand up and we can't uh, remain silent any longer, and so thus we speak out and we get involved because we cannot see injustice happen or we can't see a situation go awry. When it comes to those types of actions. Oftentimes, when other people see what we're doing, they may misunderstand our actions or our intentions and label it as unlawful. But oftentimes, time will show the truth of the actual situation. So back in 1969, on June 28th, in a little bar, a little dive called the Stonewall Inn. There were a group of people who had enough. Enough was enough. Yes. And they were motivated to action. Other people who looked at their actions called it mayhem and criminal. But what lasted for two nights became a movement. And that we can look back upon and say, that was the right, right action at the right time. So while other people might call what happened at the Stonewall Inn a riot, today I would like to highlight what, what I see as a spiritual act, and to talk about the spirituality of Stonewall. Would you pray with me? We thank you again for the times in which we are motivated to action. And we ask for your wisdom and your guidance to be strong and courageous, to stand up for ourselves and to stand up for others at the right time and at the right place. We thank you again, Christ, for this day and this season where we are about to embark upon pride. We love you and say thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, I was looking at Facebook, and you know how Facebook has various ads for t-shirts and so forth? There was one t-shirt that said, Pride began as a riot. <laughs> and it was in rainbow colors, and then this big flame that came out from that. And yes, that is one way of looking at it. But really what I, what I want to focus on is not so much around did people pray or did people, you know, hold hands and sing kumbaya, which they did not? But sometimes a spiritual act can look like resistance and can look like defending someone with your fist at times. It's like, how is that spiritual? Well, we also have read today where Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. And oftentimes when we are obeying Christ, we feel something in our heart and we realize that what we're being asked to do might be countercultural. It's been unconventional. Someone has not done it before. So God, are you truly calling me to do that? But when you can't rest, and it's almost as, as the prophet said, fire shut up in your bones, that you have to act, then you know it is indeed the spirit of the living God motivating you to do something because you won't have any rest or peace otherwise. When you think back at the time when Jesus went into the temple, and he saw all the merchants with their tables selling their doves and all their wares and cheating the people out of the poor people who came to worship God. 
hyping up the crisis for the things they needed for worship. Jesus was motivated by righteous anger, as scripture tells us. And he started to overturn those tables. And basically made a statement that this temple, God's house, would not be a den of thieves. Those who saw Jesus' actions during that time said, what is he doing? He's, he's disrupting worship. He's disrupting the way things are. But he was motivated in a different way by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God rose up into him and asked him, or told him, commanded him, to do something about this. He was motivated by his zeal for his love and his respect for God and his love and respect for the common person. When Martin Luther King embarked into the civil rights movement, there were preachers, both white and black, who saw his actions as unlawful. Why can't he just leave well enough alone? Why does he have to be an agitator? And he got labeled and called a variety of things by his colleagues. If you've read any autobiography of MLK, then you know that his desire was not to become a leader of a movement, and not to necessarily even stand up for civil rights. All he wanted to do initially was to, after he graduated from Boston University, was to become a preacher like his father, and to basically preach the gospel of the good news to the people within his congregation. However, the spirit of the living God rose up into him, and again, he had to obey what God was calling him to do. That God was calling him to something different. Other people saw what he did and, mis and, and um, mislabeled it. But here we are in 2019, and we can clearly see how the civil rights movement was spiritual. It was a spiritual act. However, many of you may remember or you've been told that back during that time, it was questionable whether what he was doing was truly motivated by the Spirit or not. Sometimes you just might need just to let things just play out on its own natural course. That everything will be in alignment eventually. You just need to let it flow. Well, yeah, that's one approach. But when you're motivated by seeing the injustice and the sometimes the hatred that other people are under, Spirit of the Living God very well may rise up in you to say and do something different. So the question I want to pose to you all this morning is: how do we know whether something is truly motivated? by the Spirit of God versus something that's truly an unlawful act that just leads to destruction. Well, going back to the story we heard today about the prophet Samuel going to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel, we've learned in that story that simply by looking on the outside on someone's outer appearance may not tell you the full story. That you need a vision from a other realm, from a spiritual place. You need to have good key vision. Let's go to the next slide, please. Having vision, not so much as what everyone else sees, because what everyone else sees oftentimes is temporal. It's earthly. The type of vision I'm referring to is a type of vision where you see beyond your current situation and you see that people are being mistreated and you see that this needs to be changed. So that's the first thing, that you simply need to have that type of vision. Clearly Samuel had it. 
as the sons of Jesse passed before him. No, not this one. No, not this one. Are you kidding me? Him? No, not him. And then the runt of the litter. Here comes David, this boy. Him? Him? This young one? You're going to select him to be the next king? But sometimes when you have vision of something, does not mean it's going to happen automatically. From the time that David was anointed as king to the time he took the throne, it was 15 years had passed. Sometimes you might have a vision of something that has not been quite manifested yet. But because you have been given that, that is your motivation to continue to move forward and to make things, make sure things are in alignment so that that vision can come to pass. The next thing, let's go to the next slide, please, is creating that type of advocacy. And I would venture to say that Martin Luther King, when he saw the plight of his people, not just in um, Birmingham, and Atlanta, but all throughout the South and all throughout the uh, United States and truly even throughout the globe. Him being called to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach that good word, I'm sure that he had a heart for the people. And it's hard to have people come into your worship service week after week when you see that they've been beat down and, and um, downtrodden throughout the week. And it's just simply how the system was set up that the, the death was stacked against various Americans, uh, African Americans, Negroes back in those days. But here is something that, um, actually I didn't include, I was going to read to you um, what some of the pastors, both black and white, said about MLK when he was uh, locked up in the Birmingham jail. Of uh, basically saying, why can't you just let things just be and go along to get along? But him be motivated for the people, being an advocate for others, that he simply could not remain silent. Is what Jesus did as well when he was overturning those tables. It wasn't solely about him. It wasn't even so much against those who were selling, you know, things at you know high prices to the people. It was for the common people that he stood up for them. He was going to be an advocate for them. So because of that vision, because of being an advocate, then that led to the next slide. Resistance. That here was a system established that preferred some over others, and it's more than just simply a preference. This was meant to snuff out the light of folks, particularly when it came to Jim Crow South. That separate was not equal. Although folks, in a sense, wanted to keep people um, um, uh, separated. We needed to come together. And he saw that, and he recognized through nonviolence resistance that we're going to do bus, bus, bus um, boycotts and lunch counter demonstrations. And to teach those young people who had vision as well, and they also want to be advocates, how to resist in a certain way. And then, to really to tell the difference between whether what you're doing is truly, whether you're going to be an agitator or whether you're acting as an advocate and a, and a um, person motivated by God, let's go to the next, next slide, is the result would be peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world, I, 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 I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. When you engage in some type of resistance, 
You're doing it oftentimes for, for the motivation to allow to have a better situation to come about. And I would say peace. For example, when what Martin Luther King did at the time, and dogs were being sicked on the um, protesters and hoses were being you know, blasted in the way and people were just seeing this mayhem that was happening. In the moment, people said, why would you do this? Why would you submit your bodies to that? Why would you simply you know, put yourself at risk like that? It's because people had a greater vision and that mo motivated them to be an advocate for themselves and for others. And they said, I have no choice but to resist the system. And I'm doing it for a better day. And here we are now in 2019, and clearly we can see the results of what Martin Luther King did was for peace. It was hard to see it in the moment, but eventually, time would tell. Going back to that Stonewall Inn, 1969, June 26, what happened during that time is people were seeing the drag queens simply gather together and they were fighting back against the police and calling them rabble rousers. In the moment, People didn't know why they were doing this. All they saw was just the mayhem. But if you step into their shoes, if you had their existence, you could then see that they wanted and desired something better, something more. And when I say something better, something more, in the moment, it's like my respect, my dignity. I don't think they necessarily got, they did all of this simply because they saw this grand um, a vision from the mountaintop like Martin Luther King talked about. It's just like, you know what, enough is enough, and I'm fighting back. You will not disrespect me and those in my community anymore. And in this moment, right here, right now, I'm going to speak up, and I'm going to stand up. And if you try to slap me, I'm going to defend myself. You're going to push me, I'm going to push you back. And this let, went on for two nights. And so when you think about what happened, go to the next slide, please. And so when you think about what happened at the Stonewall Inn, or well, was it a riot? Was it an uprising? Was it a rebellion? And the answer is yes. <laughs> All of the above. Because again, I'm not saying that everyone who comes together for a particular movement or, or action necessarily has righteous motives. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But what I am trying to make is that when we find ourselves in a situation, and we really didn't really have time to think, sometimes we're going to say, you know what, you're not going to disrespect me, and I'm going to fight back. Or I'm going to stand up, you and if I see someone else being downtrodden, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight them. Where do we get that from? Where do we get that gumption, if you will, to, to do that? Well, I believe that many of us have this vision to see a better day. And to be, for people to be safe. To, for people to be respected. Not only for myself, but for others. And if that causes me to stand up and speak out in ways that might be unconventional, might be countercultural, then I need to do that. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to queer court. <laughs> uh, excuse me, queer school, not court. Queer school. Because I want to educate all of us around individuals within the LGBT movement, whether they planned it or not, are now enshrined in the history of the liberation movement we, we now enjoy today. Because, you see, if those drag queens didn't gather and to have an uprising, 
back in 1969. Or Troy Perry, who started MCC in 1968, I'd also think that he also would have been as motivated. But when you see other people doing it, like, yeah, they do that, I can do that. And then it continues to spread. When you got something good going on, and that truly is motivated and uh, motivated and um, um, uh, um, or motivated by God, let me say that, motivated by God, that is then going to spread, and the result is going to be a better living circumstance and situation, peace for others. So the school I want to say uh, that we're about to enter into the lesson. I want to say thank you to Ronald Moore. He sent me an um, uh, email that uh, listed a lot of these. Let's go to the next slide. So in 1920, all the way back, was the Society for Human Rights. And then you see this is a former U.S. Army soldier. Here we are talking about uh, a former U.S. Army soldier on Memorial Day. How fitting. Henry um, Gerber. And so he was stationed in Germany in 1920, and he saw the rise of gay rights groups uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout Europe. So he was inspired and said he wanted to do something in America as well. So he returned to the States in 1924 to Chicago, and he developed the very first gay rights group. And that uh, group came together in December of 24, 1924, the, the Society for Human Rights. And then they produced the first ever gay rights newspaper in the country called Freedom and Friendship. Then shortly after the newsletter came out, uh, his home was raided by the police. He was arrested, his papers were confiscated, he lost his job and his life savings. That society fell apart, and, but he continued his activism until his death, until the 1970s. Imagine if you were one of his friends. Why would you do that? Why would you spend money on something like that? And now you've lost it all? Is it worth it? Well, because of what he's done, that was the precursor for what was to come. Let's go to the next slide. In the 1950s, many of you are familiar with the Mattachine Society, but some of you, this might be the very first time you've heard of it. It was formed in the early um, 1950s by Harry Hay, and it started in Southern California, but spread quickly across the country, providing space for gays and lesbians to gather and discuss their experiences as homosexuals. It was a radical concept at the time because it was illegal during that time to be out, to be open with your identity. And this organization will go on to declare that homosexuals were an oppressed minority and developing a community that was essentially designed to overcome oppression for um, uh, gays and lesbians at that time. The Mattachine Society dissolved at the end of 1960 when gay rights activism became more aggressive. Also in the 1950s, next slide, we had the Daughters of Belitis. And these two individuals, um, some of you who have been out on the West Coast have actually got to uh, meet, uh, meet the two of them. So the Daughters of Belitis was formed in 1955 in San Francisco by Phyllis Lyon and Dan Martin. And um, these two were the first two couples that got married legally in the state of California when it became uh, legal. Uh, so Dell, Dell is on your right side. She, uh, has passed away. I don't know if Phyllis has or not, but that was the first one to pass. The Daughters of Belitis. It was named after the poet Pierre Louis. Song, uh, he created the song The Belitis, in which Belitis is said to be a female lover of Greek poet Sappho. The Daughters of Belitis was one of the first lesbian organizations established in the U.S. and assembled a meeting places for lesbians. A group also, this group also held a public forum to teach people about homosexuality and provide support for single and married lesbians as well as lesbian mothers. 
They uh, eventually shut down in 1970 and the 70s, but is known for its commitment for fostering and understanding in and out the lesbian community. Next slide. In the 1960s was the Compton Cafeteria Riots. The riots at the Jean Compton Cafeteria in San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood started in August 1966. A policeman grabbed a drag queen in an attempt to arrest her, and she threw a cup of coffee in his face. A riot began almost immediately with glass windows being smashed, thrown sugar shakers, tables being flipped, cutlery being thrown, these drag queens had had enough. It was by no means unprovoked. Either cops had been arresting the drag queens, gay hustlers, transgender women at the 24-hour eatery regularly for cross-dressing and, uh, and obstructing the sidewalk. Any reason they could find to throw them in jail, they came up with. After the incident, the diner banned trans women from the Tenderloins, largely LGBT community, but from that became rebellion and picketing that establishment and breaking its new windows that had just been put up. The Compton riots received no coverage at all, but today is recognized for its importance as one of the first LGBT uprisings against police brutality. Next slide. 1970s, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Okay. The sisters first emerged in 1979 when four gay men, bored with the sameness of San Francisco Castro clones, I know Michael Hart knows what that means. Basically, if, it's, if you look a certain way, and, and you know, you're called a Castro clone. So they, didn't, they were tired of the sameness and they wanted to spice things up. They realized that their presence could bring joy and, and initiate social change and they formed an order of queer nuns. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence um, were, were birthed, and today they don drag uh, in their nun habits. They draw attention to queer discrimination and religious hypocrisy. They promote safe sex and education against the dangerous effects of drug use, while all, all while raising money for, for AIDS, LGBTQ+, and community causes, uh, community related causes. And the chapters have since expanded around the globe. And last night, the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or, or STARS. So STARS was organized by queer uh, historic icons and self-described drag queens, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. Both have been present at the Stonewall Inn uh, rebellion, and they decided to organize homeless and trans, for homeless and trans youth, they, and drag queens, sex workers, immigrants, and low-income people in New York City. Rivera and Johnson were homeless themselves, and they saw STAR as a way to help provide shelter for the people they knew as their own children. They bought a building, fixed it up, provided shelter and clothes for people who came through. Came through. Star grew from New York to Chicago, California, even England, and lasted for approximately three years before it shut down. So those are some of the movements, some of the individuals. Of course, we know about Harvey Milk and what he has done. But oftentimes, we think about a Harvey Milk or Martin Luther King, people who really have rose into high status when it comes to those types of actions. But the point of today's message, the point of today's sermon, is to look at the example of what Jesus Christ did when he overturned the tables in the temple. That simply, those of you who have who've been redeemed by Christ and call yourselves, I am a Christian, I follow Christ, you have a different vision of how this world should be. Even though it may not be here and now today, you know how things should be. So that's the very first thing, is you have that vision. Second, you have a vision not only for yourself, but for other people, and that might motivate you to action, to be an advocate for someone else. There very well may come a time 
when your advocacy might cause you to get up off the couch and to go out to the street and to be supportive of someone in some other way. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to pick up a baseball bat and smash windows, not necessarily. But if someone is coming after you or someone that you love, you very well may need to defend yourself. But in today's time, how is it that we can provide some type of resistance to the things that we see in this world, in our community, in our culture, that simply robs the life out of other people. And when I said it equals peace, I believe that the reason why we're motivated to these types of actions is because, again, we want to see a better world. We want to see a better city. We want to see a better neighborhood where people are safe, people are respected, people can truly thrive in who they are. When you're faced with that type of decision, and you don't know, again, God, is this me or is this you? Then the last thing I would say is to simply surrender your all to God. And what I mean by that is that, God, I feel like I should do this. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to surrender what I'm doing, my actions, to you. Or God, before I make any type of move, I'm going to surrender this situation to you. And if I don't have peace, if that peace has been brought for me and I know that you truly are calling me to stand up and speak out and do more than what I'm doing, currently doing, then I have no other option. I have to get involved. It's by the action of everyday individuals like you and I that truly make a difference in the lives of others. Only history will really show the true motives of our actions. People invariably will look at what we're doing and call us unlawful, countercultural, going against the grain. But we have to be obedient to what God has called us to do. We who are, who are the redeemed of God have a different vision. We see things better. We see things more clearer because we don't look through our own eyes, but through the eyes of our God. And what are the ways in which we can truly provide and make a difference in the lives of others? This is what I call the spirituality of Stone. That truly, it was not just simply a riot, but it was an act of the spirit of the living God. Because of, of what those drag queens did then, back in 1969, has provided the space for us to be here today. To simply say, our lives are normal, we're not abnormal. Our lives truly do matter. And we do need to speak up and stand, stand tall and strong for other people. And that we will worship in peace. And we will assemble in ways that are peaceful. This is a spiritual act. And I believe this is what the Spirit of the living God motivates us to do. So as we enter into this pride season, ask yourself, God, what is it that you are calling me to do? in my own way to make life better for not only for myself but for other people as well. Help me to be that spiritual element in my own, in my own community. In Jesus' name.